Well, this evening, as I've already mentioned, we're going to be looking at the importance of keeping our eyes upon the Lord and not looking at circumstances. Uh, the, the essence of what we're looking at really comes from 2 Corinthians 5, 7, where Paul says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. But rather than using that for our text, which is the theme we're going to be revolving around, I thought I would read from Matthew 14, uh, verses 22 through 33, uh, a very familiar uh, account of Peter uh, walking on the water, at least temporarily, uh, until he takes his eyes off of Jesus and begins to sink. As I read this, you'll probably hear where the, uh, the uh, was it the song we were listening to at the beginning on the water uh, came from. Uh, we do need to learn uh, to trust the Lord, let our doubts drown, but uh, let us rise up and trust in the Lord. So let me read this account, and then I'll do a bit of a review from what we saw this morning, and we want to focus on the importance of trusting the Lord, trusting His Word, what He says. Uh, this is what Matthew writes in Matthew 14, beginning in verse 22. Uh, and this, again, is following the feeding of the 5,000. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, and when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, You are certainly God's son. Now again, there's a lot of things in this particular text, but what I want us to look at is the experience of Peter, who was able to do what would be humanly impossible as long as he had his eyes fixed upon Jesus, but once he took his eyes off, began to sink. Now, I do want to uh, link this with what we saw this morning in Luke 18, and I will be making reference to that as well, because Jesus was addressing a particular, um, uh, particular issue that the disciples were facing and would face, and what Jesus was going to do about it, and the encouragement that he gave to them to continue to believe and to trust that he would, even though that would be yet many years off. Okay, so again, just from what we saw this morning, remember this morning, we were encouraged to, to pray and to ask God for the things that we, what we need. Uh, we saw that even Jesus needed to pray. He became just as dependent on the Father's provision as, as we are when he became a man. And obviously, Jesus prayed, and if he needed to pray, how much more do we need to pray for the Lord's blessings? Now, we also noted prayer is really the only way the Father has given to us to get what we need. Now, it may have seemed earlier in our walk that we were meeting our own needs, and that's often what we think about when we're outside of Jesus or the way we think things are happening, that I did these things, I worked, and I got all these, uh, you know, the money and the things that I need to take care of my needs. But obviously, as we get older, we learn that it is all in the Lord's hands. We wouldn't even exist if it weren't for Him. We wouldn't have the strength to work if it weren't for Him, the opportunity to work. We wouldn't have any benefit from that work. And the same thing is true with regard to spiritual warfare. We wouldn't have the spiritual strength we need to face our enemies 
on a daily basis unless the Lord was providing for us. Now, in our youth, in our ignorance, the Lord may have given us his provision. He may have given us his spirit without our asking the way that Jesus tells us that we should ask. He did that because he's good, because he's patient, because he's, you know, he, he gives us time to, to see these things. We don't understand them all at one time. But once we did, once we understood who it was that was providing for us, then he did begin to expect us to ask and to thank him for the things that he is giving to us. Now, we also saw that there are things that get in the way of our prayers, and this is how we sort of came at the text we were looking at. We see, or we saw this morning, that sin can get in the way of our prayers. We need things from the Father, but, and it is our duty to pray and to pray at all times, but there are things that can keep us from receiving uh, the things that we need from the Lord. And one of those things is, is our own sin. David writes in Psalm 66, verse 18, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. We need to deal with our sins before we come to Him. Unbelief, which is essentially what we're dealing with this evening, we also looked at this morning. We have to believe that the Lord will give us what He has promised and what we have asked. James writes in James 1, verses 6 and 7, but he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord. The selfishness is something else that gets in the way. Again, James writes in James chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Uh, the unjust judge was selfish, self-centered. He didn't care about God, didn't care about man, only cared about himself. If we come to the Lord with that same kind of attitude, uh, the Lord won't answer our prayers, but he will if we pray for his glory. And we saw that prayerlessness can also get in the way. The fact that we don't want to pray, James says in James 4 verse 2, you do not have because you do not ask. Sometimes we don't get what we need from the Lord because we're just not praying. And one of the reasons that we're tempted not to pray is that sometimes we may think it doesn't really make any difference whether we do or not, that the Lord won't hear us, or if he does hear us, that he won't answer us. I think if, if we were all to be asked that question, have we ever felt that way? Have we ever believed that? I think we'd all have to answer that at some point in our lives we have. But now Jesus encouraged us this morning that we should come we have every reason to come and every reason to expect that the Lord will receive us and that he will give us what we're asking. And he did that through the parable of the unjust judge. In the, if, he said, if this self-centered judge would give to this poor widow the protection that she wanted because she wouldn't leave him alone, how much more will our heavenly father who loves us who actually commands us to come to him, who wants to help us, who cares for our well-being, and of course the well-being of his kingdom because that's one of the things we're coming to him with. Actually, it's the center of everything that we're bringing to him, who has given us an advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, who makes our prayers acceptable, who has given us his Holy Spirit to help us to pray, to move us to pray, who has promised to hear us, and it says he even delights when we come to him. I mean, we're not a bother to him. He loves it when we come. How much more will he answer our prayers? If the unjust judge will listen to the poor widow because of her persistence and her bothering, how much more will the heavenly Father receive our prayers and give us what we ask? Now, Jesus never became discouraged in the, the middle of the difficulties he had to face, and his difficulties were great because he knew that he could pray and ask his Father for whatever it was that he needed. We have this same encouragement because Jesus has opened that door for us through his work. Uh, all these things we just saw that were true of the Father and his desire to have us come are true because of what Jesus has done. But as we saw also this morning, there is a second part to this equation, and that is the belief that the Lord hears us and the hope that we have that he will answer us. 
If we want to be free from discouragement, we need to have faith. We need to believe that the Lord will be true to His Word. We need to keep our eyes fastened upon Him and His, His faithfulness, His truthfulness, to know that He will answer our prayers. Now, again, we're, we're talking this evening about faith. Faith is something, as you know, is absolutely essential to the Christian faith. Faith is how we receive the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way that we can receive from the Lord anything that He has to give us. It was through faith that we received Jesus and His cleansing atonement and His righteousness to cover our nakedness. It was really by faith that we continue to receive from Him day by day what we need as far as our standing before the Lord to continue to cleanse us and to clothe us and to make us acceptable to the Father throughout this life until we finally arrive in heaven. We were looking this morning as I was going through the new members class uh, of the, the doctrine of perseverance of the saint. We, we can also call that the preservation of the saint. The Lord is going to keep us. He is going to preserve us. And the reason or the way He does it is through faith because we continue to look to Jesus. We continue to confess our sins and repent of our sins and renew our faith in Him day by day. Faith is not a one-time act. And that has to do, of course, with our salvation. But faith is also the way that we receive everything that the Lord has promised to give us, particularly in the context of what we were looking at this morning, his deliverance from the enemies of our souls, those that stand in our way of becoming what Jesus wants us to become, of doing what Jesus wants us to do. And again, remember those enemies are three, the devil who wants to destroy us, and he would destroy us except for the Lord's preservation. The world that the devil uses as bait to try to tempt us away from what the Lord would have us to do and, of course, the ally that the devil has in our hearts, which is that remaining corruption, that remaining sin that's still there, even though the Lord has given to us grace. It's that old man, that flesh that we are to put to death. Now, again, we need grace in order to overcome these things. We receive that by praying and by keeping our eyes fixed upon the Lord. Now, getting back to that parable we looked at this morning, the parable of the unjust judge, we saw that it does have a broad application. And we've just reviewed what that is, that we should look to the Lord at all times for all of our needs and not be discouraged. Uh, Luke writes in Luke 18, verse 1, Now, he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart. But Jesus was, in this parable, focusing on a specific application to strengthen his disciples against the discouragement they would have to face as they would be continually attacked by their spiritual enemies. And essentially, these attacks from the Jews and the potential discouragement really are all expressions of the three enemies that we have to face. They would have to face primarily the unconverted Jews. Those are the ones that would hate them and want to kill them. Well, they are those of the world. And they were being motivated by the other enemy that we all have, and that is the devil, who is trying to stop them from sharing the gospel so that others wouldn't hear it, come to know Jesus, and be freed from his kingdom. And uh, they would also then be tempted by the weakness of their flesh that would constantly try to get them not to believe in Jesus and to leave off praying because the Lord's coming in judgment against these enemies, against these foes, was yet many years off. In other words, as they would go out to preach the gospel, they would be attacked by the world, by the devil, by Satan, and they would face discouragement because of their sin because of their flesh. But now, listen to what Jesus says again at the end of that particular parable in verses 6 through 8. He says, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect 
who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That is, when he comes to bring justice. Now, the disciples were already being persecuted because they were following Jesus at that particular time, but Jesus said he was going to ascend, and he was sending them out, and they would continue to be persecuted as they were going out and doing this work. But it was because of this persecution that they were having to face, the persecution that the Jews first brought against Jesus, and then also against him and his people, that he was going to bring this judgment that he's referring to at the end of this text. I believe that he is talking primarily about his judgment against the Jews in 70 AD. Remember what Jesus said to the Jewish leaders in Matthew chapter 23, verses 33 through 38. Now here he's talking to the religious leaders of Israel. You serpents, you brood of vipers, How will you escape the sentence of hell? Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Who were these prophets, these wise men and these scribes? These were his disciples that he was sending out to preach the gospel. Some of them you will kill and crucify. And some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. Let me just pause there and say he's not talking about this race of people, but he's talking about the generation of the Jews that were living at that time. Jesus spoke this. 30 A.D., 70 A.D. was coming when the Lord was going to bring judgment. Now notice he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. He was referring to 70 A.D. when Jerusalem would be surrounded by her enemies, when the temple would be destroyed, when the glory would essentially depart, when Jesus would fulfill what he said to the Jewish leaders, the kingdom of heaven is going to be taken away from you and given to another nation that will produce its fruits. But this, you see, would be the answer to their prayers, the prayers of his disciples, of his elect, who cry out to him day and night. The answer is he was coming in judgment. They just needed to hold on to that promise to believe it and not to become discouraged. The Lord was going to deal with their disobedience. But again, in order for them to be encouraged by this promise of Jesus that he would make all these wrongs right, they actually had to believe that he was going to do this. You know, he's talking in 30 AD, we're still talking about 40 years off. Now, notice again in Luke 18, verse 8, where Jesus basically tells them this. I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly, and 40 years is for him is quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Jesus is telling his disciples when he would come in this judgment, would he find faith among his followers then? Would he find them still believing and still waiting for him to bring about their vindication as he had promised? Or would they have lost hope? Would they have become disheartened? Now, Jesus is implying by what he's saying here that by that time, their faith will have been stretched to the limit, that he will find few among his disciples that have the faith that they should have. There would be relatively few. Now, what Jesus was saying would be true then is really something that is true in in every age, and that is there are always just a few that have faith and that believe. It was certainly true in David's day. We read in Psalm 12, verse 2, 
Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. Remember, as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm reminded of what Elijah said during his time. Remember uh, that there were so few that seemed to be faithful to the Lord that had faith, true faith, that it looked like nobody believed. But the Lord told him that he had reserved several thousand who had not bowed the knee to Baal. During Jesus' ministry, he mentioned there would be few that would believe. Matthew 7, verses 13 through 14 in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the, and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. And then we fast forward to the end of the world. What's it going to be like when Jesus comes again? John tells us in his vision of Jesus' return that the camp of the saints is going to be very small compared to the ungodly that are in the world. In Revelation 20, verses 7 through 9, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they come up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. Now Jesus is, through this, encouraging his disciples to continue to trust, to continue to hold on to him, to trust him to do what he has promised that he's going to do no matter how long it takes and not lose hope. They need to believe the Lord and not look at the circumstances. I mean, 40 years is a long time to have to endure. Some of the disciples died before Jesus came with that judgment and with that vindication. Uh, Jesus is basically telling them they need to hold on to him and trust him. Now, I hope you can see from this that Faith is the only thing that can really keep us from becoming discouraged. We do need not to look at the circumstances, but rather to look at the Lord and to focus our attention upon Him and His promises. That's what Jesus is telling His disciples to do at the end of, of that parable in Luke 18. When the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? Are you going to trust that this is true? What if He's told you? Are you going to believe? Are you going to be waiting and looking? Uh, John Trapp, the English Puritan pastor, uh, puts it in this way, and I, I think this is a wonderful summary of, of what it is I'm uh, certainly trying to explain. He says, it is the nature of faith to believe God upon his bare words. It will not be, says, saith sense. It cannot be, saith reason. It both can and will be, saith faith for I have a promise for it. John Trapp is telling us we need to believe what God says upon his bare word, even if the circumstances seem completely the opposite of what the Lord has promised. Now, this is what Paul really meant when he wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Uh, these, uh, there are things that we must believe on the basis of God's word alone. As a matter of fact, we might say everything that has to do with the kingdom of God, we take on the basis of his word. Now, in the context of 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is, is basically telling the Corinthians what's ahead of them, what glorious things are there. God has prepared a place in heaven for us. We know that the only reason why we're not there right now is because we're still here in our bodies, but when our bodies are torn down, uh, when we die, when this tent is, is taken down, then we will go to that eternal and blessed place that the Lord has prepared for us in heaven. Now, how do we know that that's true? Is it because we've seen heaven and with, with our eyes that that we you know, can perceive it, it's a place we can go to and look and know for certain that it exists? Well, no, we cannot perceive it with our senses. 
Is it something that we reason our way to? We just look at the, uh, the world around us and we, we look at the principles of logic and through logic we come to the conclusion that God has prepared a place for us in heaven? Well, no, because reason cannot lead us to that conclusion by itself. The only way that we can know that heaven is real is through faith. We believe it merely because God has said it. We take it on the basis of his bare word because he has promised that everyone who believes in his son will have eternal life, that he has prepared a place for us. Jesus told us that he has. As Trapp says, again, or as he said as we just read, it will not be, saith sense, it cannot be, saith reason, it both can and will be, saith faith, for I have a promise for it. Now, if we would do what our Lord Jesus Christ has told us to do at the end of the parable of the unjust judge, actually at the beginning, pray at all times and not lose hope, we do have to believe that God will do what he says in his word he will do. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and the promises of God that are in him, that are yes in him, that are confirmed in him. Remember what Jesus did, he did so that everything God has promised will be ours. And as I was thinking about just how valuable such, well, this, this truth is, this principle is, how valuable it is to our, our well-being, to our strength, to our hope. I couldn't help but see the parallels between that principle and what we read a little bit earlier about Peter's walking on the water. I think it's a tremendous illustration of this, of this very thing. And again, remember, as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he was able to do the impossible. <laughs> he could walk on water. Now, we do need to remember that Peter didn't do this on his own. He didn't just jump out of the boat presuming that he'd be able to walk on the water, presuming that he would be able to do what Jesus was doing. Peter had a command that gave him the warrant to get out of the boat and to come to Jesus. And you might say there was an implied promise that if he did, that he wasn't just going to plummet down to the bottom, but that he was going to be able to walk. We read in Matthew 14, verse 28, Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Let's not forget, Peter was just like us in, in every way, and yet here he was doing something that was impossible. But as soon as he took his eyes off of Jesus and began looking at the circumstances surrounding him, at the wind and the waves, at the fact that he was standing on nothing but water, he began to doubt. It can't be, said his sense. It, it won't be, says reason, and suddenly it wasn't. He began to sink into the water. It wasn't until he cried out again that for Jesus to reach out and save him that he took hold of his hand and he rescued him. Whenever we take our eyes off of Jesus and off of the promises of God that are in Jesus and we begin to look at the circumstances around us instead, when we begin to doubt that what he says is true and that he's going to do what he says he's going to do, we begin to sink into the sea of doubtfulness as well as Peter did. We do need to understand that if we walk by sight and not by faith, then we're not going to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. We're not going to see it as, as being worth it. We're not going to believe we can do it because really we can't do it apart from His grace. But it's not what we see that matters. It's not what we think is going to happen that matters. What matters is what the Lord has determined is going to take place. What matters is that we actually believe him and trust him. You know, there was a, a circumstance in the scriptures where the king of Aram was getting upset because every time he tried to attack Israel, Elisha would tell the king in advance and they'd be ready for them. And the king was saying, who, who among my people is, is for Israel? Who keeps giving away my secrets? And 
One of the persons who was there, one of the king's advisors said, but none of, none of your men are traitors, that there's a prophet in Israel who is able to tell the king of Israel what you say in your own bedroom. And so when the king of Aram heard this, he sent out armies that surrounded Elisha's house in order to take him. And so Elisha's servant is going out in the morning in order to do some chores, and he looks around and he sees that house surrounded by all these armies, and the first thing he thought was, <laughs> we're, we're finished. And so he runs in to where Elisha was, and Elisha calmly prays. He says, Lord, open the eyes of my servant and show him. And when the Lord did, the servant looked all around and he saw the armies of the Lord surrounding the armies of Aram and he saw that those who were for them were much more than those who were against him and his fears were relieved. Well, you see, that's the way the situation is, isn't it? Uh, we often look around and we see the armies of the world surrounding us and we think that there's no way we're going to be able to deal with them. But we do need to realize that those who are for us are much more than those who are against us. That's what the Lord says. We don't have to be afraid. We simply need to walk by faith and not by sight. Live in the light of God's word and the reality of his promises, not by what reason tells us, not by what our senses tell us. We need to believe him. That's certainly how our Lord Jesus lived, and that's how he calls us uh, to live as well. well let's, uh, let's bow for a few moments of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us to do that.